Good afternoon, everyone. I know it's been a long day. Um, Marianne had asked me to spend a few minutes talking about something that happened earlier this week, and then I'm going to invite my fellow panelists to the stage. So you may have heard, uh, I am one of the co-counsels uh, to the Fearless Fund. This is a venture capital firm that has, was created a number of years ago to address a disturbing disparity that exists in the venture capital space. So to give you more context, <clears throat> $288 billion, with a B, is allocated each year in the venture capital space. And of the $288 billion that's allocated, only 0.036% goes to black women founders, black women entrepreneurs. So these two women decided, well, we can't we're not receiving resources from the larger ecosystem, so we're going to create our own company. We're going to create a charitable organization to provide support to other people of color who are looking for resources. They've been doing this now for more than five years. Uh, last August, they were sued by an organization called the American Alliance for Equal Rights. If you've never heard of it, there's a reason because uh, they're new. And their goal is uh, to eradicate all laws and policies that support race-based programs. Edward Blum is the person who runs that organization. They sued the Fearless Fund and the Fearless Foundation, ostensibly for violating federal law. Their theory is that if you provide grants and resources to women of color and black women specifically, you violate a statute that was passed after Reconstruction in 1866. And this statute was passed to allow black people to enter into contracts. Remember, before the Civil War, we were considered property. We couldn't enter into contracts. We couldn't own property, we couldn't get an education. So this statute was passed, it's called 1981 of the Civil Rights Act. And this statute was passed to ostensibly close this big gap. So now these women have been sued, and we are representing them, along with Gibson Dunn and a, and a few other lawyers. And um, they filed a complaint as well as a preliminary injunction motion. And we were successful in defeating the preliminary injunction motion at the district court on several grounds, which I'll allow my colleague to go into. And then uh, they filed an appeal. And the appeal went up to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, and on Monday, a decision was issued essentially saying that this organization that has now sued the Fairless Foundation has standing for the non-lawyers in the room, has a right to bring a case bef before the court. And second, that they have shown a likelihood of success on the merits. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about what this decision means um, on the panel, but I want to give you my personal context and why it's important to all of us in this room. This decision is not just about whether black people can issue grants to other black people. This is about whether or not we live in a free enterprise economy. This is about whether or not we are creating an infrastructure for economic opportunity for all. Because as we all know, charitable organizations have existed for decades. And charitable organizations have been allocating resources and funding to specific demographic groups for decades. So why is it now that a black-owned company that is providing those resources to black people can no longer do that because it's deemed unconstitutional, is deemed against the law? We're going to talk about this and many other issues. Um, the title of this panel is Creating a Roadmap or a Roadmap for creating economic opportunity for all. And this decision fits squarely within the parameters of this discussion. Because as we fight for economic opportunity for all, all need to recognize that we're not fighting for any one demographic group. We're fighting essentially for freedom. We're fighting for the ability to operate in a capitalist country, in a capitalist construct, without the, the limitations that are now being assigned to certain groups of people. And to have this conversation, I'm going to invite to the stage Janice Bodler. <laughs> Melissa Bradley. 
Aaliyah Hawk, and Sakia Salem Williams. Okay, so hopefully I've set the stage for this conversation. From building and sustaining personal financial wellness to leading small businesses and multinationals, a significant racial gap pervades our nation's financial and, e and e economic ecosystem. So I'll ask this question to the audience. When Martin Luther King gave his speech, I Have a Dream, right here in Washington, DC, the wage gap was eight to one. Mm -hmm. The wealth gap, sorry, not the wage, the wealth gap. What do you think the wealth gap is today between white and black people in the United States? Anyone? It ain't the SAT, people, come on. <laughs> <laughs> it was eight to one, what do you think it is now? 15 to one. Anyone else? 12 to 1. Someone read something. It's 12 to 1. <laughs> <laughs> he Googled it. It is 12 to 1. Mm -hmm. So as we talk about economic prosperity, as we talk about economic opportunity for all, it's important for us to take a step back and talk about the wealth gap. We're not talking about the wage gap. right? The wage gap is what you make in your income. Mm -hmm. The wealth gap is what you own in assets. Mm -hmm. And that wealth gap is increasing. So in 2024, it is 12 to 1 as opposed to 8 to 1 in the 1960s. And we are struggling mm -hmm. with all of these embedded institutional systems that make it much more difficult for people of color and other marginalized communities to obtain what we're calling wages or wealth and additional assets. Mm -hmm. So as I just welcome to the stage, and I'll give them a little bit more color, the folks on the stage, Janet Bo Janice Bodler, who's the counselor for racial equity at the Department of Treasury. She's also the former president of the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation. Janice's career has spanned local service, national advocacy, and international philanthropy. She launched her career in her native Northeast Ohio with Famico's uh, Foundation, and she spent 10 years at UNODOS, then the National Council of La Raza, advocating for economic mobility opportunities for Latino families. Melissa Bradley is the CEO of 1866 Ventures, a black-led national business development not-for-profit accelerator and venture capital fund. In this capacity, she has created a community of more than 10,000 new majority entrepreneurs in three years. She is the former co-chair of the National Advisory Council for Innovation and Entrepreneurship and was named one of the most entrepreneurial women investors in 2018. Aaliyah Hawk is the Chief Operating Officer for the Academy for Advancing Excellence, which is a leadership development company that works both with large and small entities on advancing leadership principles, conducting institutional assessments, and developing talent pipelines. She is the past board chair for the National Family Preservation Network and Promise House. Mm -hmm. Finally, Sakia Salem Williams is a partner and Chief Diversity Officer at the law firm Gibson Dunn who leads various diversity and inclusion efforts, driving the firm's commitment to being a market leader in DNI efforts and initiatives. Sakia has worked at Gibson Dunn for more than a decade and played a leading role in launching the firm's successful women of Gibson Dunn and black advancement initiatives. Both proved to be a success, resulting in an increase of women partners and black lawyers by over 100%. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank so, our task is to dissect how to build scalable and sustainable solutions for creating economic opportunity for all. So I'll ask all of you this question, and we can start with Janice. What are the key factors contributing to the racial gap in the nation's financial and economic systems? Uh, I'm so glad I get to kick this off. Because <laughs> it's no I didn't small, warn any of them. It's no small question. Um, well, first of all, the, the biggest driver of the wealth gap is the fact you don't have wealthy parents. Um, the fact that wealth is generational. And I think it's worth taking a moment on why it's so important that we're focused on wealth. Because in a moment, we're going to get to policy. And there's a lot of policy hooks around income and a lot of policy hooks around getting good jobs. 
but the research shows that having a good job is not enough to create generational wealth. The best way to have generational wealth is to have wealthy parents. And if you don't have that, then we gotta talk about other ways uh, to build wealth. And so we have, we have a cyclical challenge. And um, it was probably fair for Alfonso to pitch this question to me first because the federal government had a lot to do with creating the wealth gap that we are all living with, with the inability to own property. We know historically it is investments from the uh, from the federal sector, from the public sector in particular, that have built the middle class. They're really good at it. We are really good at it. We just blocked people of color, black people specifically, native people specifically, brown people specifically, from those opportunities, and they have exacerbated over time. Mm. And so we have this situation in which wealth begets wealth, and the wealth gap continues to to widen under our feet. I'm excited about this conversation because we are now living in the midst of one of the biggest public sector investments that probably are gonna happen in our lifetimes with the um, investing in America agenda. And so we have an opportunity now to change that, to change the trajectory. We're seeing that wealth in black and Latino households actually went up for the first time and went up more than it did for white households. Somebody, somebody's gonna buzz me. I don't know this entirely for sure, but based on, <laughs> I know, my, my, my lawyers are gonna find me. <laughs> Let's just say at the same time, we are also seeing um, record number of uh, entrepreneurship in our communities. Yeah. And so I think we have incredible opportunities in the traditional drivers of wealth, as well as in with a massive, pairing that with a massive public sector investment. But I, I think, we have to start by acknowledging that the public sector has helped to create this problem, so we have to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Melissa, anything to add there? You've been in the business and investment sectors for a long time. I'm just so happy that Janice is where she is uh, and that she can speak on behalf of the government and take the blame for them. Um, uh, I, I just think that's wonderful because that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Yeah. Um, but, but I would just echo and say quickly, I think the reason why we are where we are, particularly as black people, mm -hmm. is that this, company, this country was built with black people as a commodity. Yeah. We were the underlying assets that stood up many banks, probably that people in here work or bank with, mm -hmm. and many of the other institutions that still exist. When the Kerner Commission came out, the government had a chance mm -hmm. to do something different mm -hmm. because they were literally told that racism was going to cause an economic decline in this country and they chose to shove it under the rug. And today, we are still the largest commodity in terms of purchasing power, et cetera. And so I think the reason we are where we are is because of fear, mm -hmm. uh, because of loss of power. And when we think about entrepreneurship where black and brown folks are the fastest growing segment, black women are the fastest segment within yeah. that, that it makes sense that now lawyers are saying you can't give them money. And so I think that the premise of this country built on freedom and equity for all is bullshit. Mm -hmm. And I think that when, when I use the term new majority, that people are in fear and therefore they're acting out and they're acting out in their own best interest, unfortunately not in the best interest of the country, because if this country had followed the Kerner report, we would have a $4 trillion surplus in the national deficit as opposed to a multi-trillion dollar deficit that we have right now. So there is history that says this country is willing to act against its own self-interest in the name of racism. Mm. Mm. Great. <laughs> Aaliyah? So I'm gonna make things just a little bit more personal. How many of you have a financial planner currently? Okay, and ha just throw it out there. About what age did you get that financial planner? <laughs> okay, so I have friends who are of the dominant group who got financial planners when they turned 16. There's a different level of exposure to wealth and wealth building that black families are not typically exposed to. Is that changing now? Of course it is, with more access, with the internet, with more access to information, yes. But historically, we did not have the access. I grew up in a family, my family is from Texas, and they've owned land for generations, gener literally generations, for at least four generations. When my grandparents were ailing, they had 19 properties. 
They had no idea what a trust was. They had no idea what other financial instruments were to actually save any money. They spent over $400,000 in cash for long-term care. That is giving away your family's wealth right there. So we don't always have the knowledge to know how to make these moves so that we can build generational wealth. I have a friend in the audience, Simone Griffin Taylor, who told, taught me a new term, financial therapy, which I love it. Mm. Uh, thank you for giving it to me for this <laughs> today. But financial therapy. There's also a, a, a disconnect with money and wealth building that is just pervasive in the community as well. Ooh, that was so. I think I'll get personal too. For me, I, I think everything's about educational attainment and opportunity. I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. Um, and I grew up in an inner city in Philadelphia. Very, like I am every sort of sociology experiment. You take the kid from, that went to the all black school, move them to a better neighborhood and diverse school, I moved to middle school, I have eight siblings, I was the youngest, I attained the most education in sort of building wealth. It was, I read it in the New York Times and I was like, wow, that's me. And so when I think about the wealth gap, I think it starts there. It starts with your parents. It was not my fault that my parents weren't wealthy, didn't have all the things to give me to get out of whatever circumstances I, I you know, our family was in every ale. So I think in order to close the wealth gap, we need to talk about everything about the education system as well, because we get nowhere by leaving so many people behind. And let's be very clear, there are so many people being left behind. And one thing that's happening in the courts is determined to sort of leave them even further behind. And we'll talk about that. So mm -hmm. I think expectations, opportunity, how do you change the circumstance of people who are born into environments that are not having these conversations, don't have land and all of those things. So why don't we pick up that thread, and Melissa, this is for you, um, going from problem to solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What initiatives have proven effective in advancing financial literacy and say asset development and, and wellness and management? Yeah, well, I, th I mean, I think there's a lot. Um, I, I think that JP Morgan, has done a lot, obviously under Janice's leadership. Um, I think there are a lot. I think I'll say this because I think there's been a lot of programs, right? Because I think when we say financial literacy, we're not talking about like two plus two. Mm -hmm. right? We're really talking about kind of financial intuition in terms of how to navigate the opportunities and obstacles so there's still enough left to take care of myself longe long long longevity. Um, but I think there's are tons of programs. I think there's tons of tech platforms um, that have now come along. But I think we have to remember that the capital markets were intentionally. Uh, unavailable because of the minimum threshold. So I think there have been lots of apps. I don't want to get in trouble by naming anybody particular, but you can, you know, invest in a share. It's probably five thousand dollars and only a hundred dollars. So I think there's been a lot of those. Um, so I think there is opportunity, but I think what we fail to forget, though, is that that requires a level of discretionary income, mm -hmm. and and we don't have a lot of that, right? I mean, there, you know, there's a, this exercise that I guess people on the hill used to do with the cost of being poor and everything costs more. And so I think it's interesting because the accessibility has improved, mm -hmm. but the ability to make that decision and manage the opportunity cost, particularly post COVID, mm -hmm. that says, well, wait a minute, if I get sick, do I have enough money to take my kid somewhere? Mm -hmm. um, so I, 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 wanna, I, I wanna give more examples and, and I can, um, but I, I, in my heart right now, I'm feeling we have to understand that while there's programs, we have yet to build the bridge to get there. Yep. Many years ago, there was a program that we were fortunate to participate in that actually came out of the Corporation for Enterprise Development, Bob Friedman, which were individual development accounts, mm -hmm. right? We said, if you save, we'll match you, right? A, a local organization could get corporate sponsors or government money, whatever, and they would match those savings as long as they were for a house, for a college tuition, or to start a business. Wow. Mm -hmm. All asset development things. That was amazing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, economically, there were programs in California like 20 to one. Yeah. Um, but that has somewhat gone away. Um, we have things like child savings accounts, but I think what we have to do is recognizing that since as a black person you have robbed me 
of all the money that I could have had, mm -hmm. I believe that I am entitled for to really continue to think about my wealth building should be a partnership with those who stole from me. And so if mm -hmm. I put up money, you should put up money. This is how wealthy white people stay wealthy because it's called leverage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so I do believe, uh, I'm not sitting here saying reparations or anything like that, but I believe that there has to be an ability for black people in particular, but all people of color, to maintain leverage because that's what makes the difference in the capital market. It's not just let me put in a dollar and I get back two, it's let me put in a thousand and then when it splits, add more and then understand what's the right IRA account and when do I move money and that we don't have access to. And so I think that's where literacy to me is the common of can I add, subtract and do I understand checking and savings? It is do I have wealth awareness so that I can make the decisions of how to make my money work for me. Well, Please. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Let's, let's talk about asset development and entrepreneurship, because mm -hmm. that's sort of where you're leading us yep. to, right? So folks who may not have the resources to be born into wealth generally are looking at entrepreneurship and creating their own businesses as a tool to yep. create that wealth. Yep. So I want to talk about the challenges that we currently have in the landscape. And Janice, if you can weigh in on this. Mm -hmm. Many people may or may not know there's an organiz or an agency called MBDA, Minority mm -hmm. Development Business Agency, which is a part of the Department of Commerce here in, the, in Washington. Mm -hmm. And that agency was created in the 1960s uh, when Richard Nixon was president. And the goal of that agency was to close the gap, the disparity gap that existed in contracting. Minority contractors seeking to get contracts with the federal government, they were denied in large part or almost exclusively because of their race. That agency was created to try to address that problem. A recent decision from a tex Texas federal judge concluded that um, the agency's programs should no longer be enforced and that they're unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. So that's just within the landscape that we're talking about entrepreneurship and wealth building. Mm -hmm. Janice, can you and Melissa and anyone else talk a little bit about um, what are the main challenges that you see for black and brown entrepreneurs who are seeking to build wealth through the lens of creating their own businesses? Yeah, so I want to um, pick up on a couple of threads that I've, I've heard so far. I mean, one is this, this issue around um, that, Aliyah, you raised in terms of like having access to the right tools. One of the challenges that I see with traditional financial literacy programs is that they, it's, it's, I sometimes refer to them as the pamphlet parade. It's like you get, you get the budget, you get the workshop, and then you know, we all get to stand here and say, you, know, you're, you're real, you really should take that 20 bucks and put it over here. You should stop getting cable, and if you did that, then you would have, like, that's, that's not actually the thing that is, yes, can, can we all be better? But I generally challenge anybody uh, in any room that I go in, in my current employer, my previous employer, before members of Congress, to live on minimum wage and still send 300 bucks a month back to your family living in another country somewhere. Mm -hmm. Turns out that our families are actually really savvy and know how to stretch a buck mm -hmm. in a way that probably rich people don't know how to do. They're just facing a financial system and a set of products that either are not built for us or that we just don't have access to. We don't know how to put our, our stuff in trust. We don't know how to navigate the, the tax system in a way that benefits our situation fully. So I, I think those, those barriers are real. Then there are some of the structural issues, Alfonso, that you kicked off and has been a project that I've been working on around um, how are we getting access to kind of the, the parts of the economic system where big growth engines are happening. And so can, can I nerd for a second on oh, yeah, one of please. my, okay, nerd on. thank you. Um, I was going to, but it's <laughs> helpful to have the, um, the not, no, I'm not going to get the hook. Um, so th this, uh, we, we have a treasury program, the state small business credit initiative. It gives money to states $10 billion, two and a half billion of which is for socially and economically disadvantaged individuals. The program gives states broad flexibility to think about how to program for small business growth. Um, and, uh, and then there are these hooks to make sure that uh, disadvantaged individuals, which include 
people of color includes rural areas, it includes veterans, uh, women, LGBTQIA people, um, make sure that they can get access to this pot of money. Uh, when I looked at this program and started working with it within the Treasury Department, my concern was that uh, states could meet this obligation kind of entirely on the microloan side, right? And that, that's often how our businesses get thought of. And I'm not, there is no shade on microloans and the businesses that need them. My husband runs a small business in, that is a micro business in Baltimore. But back to the point that you kicked us off with, Alfonso, like our folks are not getting those big equity checks. And now the public is putting money to states to write big equity checks. And so how do we make sure that we're not limited to just the microloans, but we're also getting the big investments? And so our theory of the case that we have been working with states on is can we get money to proximate allocators? Can we get them to black and brown and diverse-led funds or funds with a strong track record of investing in people of color as a way to increase the odds that the, those big growth checks go there? Um, and uh, at, at our most recent counting, of the 40 VCs that have received investments through this program so far, under this round, 29 of them either have diverse founders or diverse investment strategies. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing now tens of millions of dollars, I hope we start to see bees behind that, but are now flowing to diverse-led funds. So I... For me, and in, in, in my seat, I see structural challenges, and I want to make sure that we're building structural solutions. I hope that an outcome of this is not just, I mean, it's a big deal to have public money go to diverse-led funds, but that in the process, we're also building balance sheet and track record of diverse-led yeah. funds to, to go out there and get the next bigger deal. So I, we can, I think we can talk a lot about the interpersonal challenges that a lot of us have reflect our lived experience, but we have structural challenges and at least my day job keeps me up like thinking about what are the structural solution sets to make sure that I'm up in the odds uh, for everybody who's out there, you guys doing what you do to hustle on behalf of our community. Can we so just, can I, can I go just ahead, say, <laughs> so this is the hard part of it this job. So in the aftermath of the Supreme Court's affirmative action decision, when I hear all of this amazing progress and this pointing your dollars to diverse businesses, what I see are about five groups that are monitoring every single thing that she just said really attacking it. So the lawsuit that you talked about, um, and since the affirmative action, the, the attacks on DEI and lawsuits against DEI didn't start with the affirmative action decision. We counted probably 25 or 30 cases and letters being sent prior to. By month two, there was more than that. Now there's been 50 lawsuits, there's been 51 pieces of legislation, and there's been 31 letters or more sent mm -hmm. to the ELC. There's a lawsuit filed every two weeks, um, and now the companies are starting to be sued. But this is what th this is the progress that you know is trying to be stymied. And so I think we're all when we talk about challenge, that's like a cloud <laughs> mm -hmm. hanging over all of this because there has been progress. There are more people in college. There is more wealth. There are more black businesses. And with that becomes a thing. And I'll just say, if we talk about black and Latinos, if you work in any company, you know if you focus on the smallest group, <laughs> it's canary in a coal mine. You will get more progress focusing on this small group for every other person, because you have to change so many systems to make it work for that group. So you're stymieing progress, not just for black people, but for the entire yeah. company. Yeah. So I, I say that to say, because we're, we're in the midst of this. We probably have, we have five of the lawsuits um, representing a lot of nonprofits who are giving small grants to people of color, but the, the federal government is not. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do think that we have to think about this holistically, but I, I think right now, and at least we have all of the pieces together. Melissa's an expert in the Fearless Fund case. 
Alfonso is involved in masterminding sort of the strategy alongside Gibson Dunn and others, I think we're on the right path of thinking about it, but I will say the path is very rocky. But I just want to pull out a couple of things that, that you said I think it's important. Um, one, that it's proximate, right? We have to allow the communities that are impacted to yep. manage their own solutions. Yeah. And, and I think that's huge. And I happen mm -hmm. to know some of the folks who got the money, and I think it's going to go to really good mm -hmm. use. Because I think what people have to understand is that, that venture, it's racist, it's sexist, all those things. But as a finance person, mm -hmm. right, I have a fiduciary responsibility to deliver my money back. Mm -hmm. And I make those decisions based on a box of risk tolerance. White investors in Silicon Valley who I've worked with and still do, their box has a set of inputs in it. And oftentimes risk is automatically assigned to race. Mm -hmm. If I'm a black or brown GP, I see race as an asset. They see it as a liability. Mm -hmm. And so it's extremely important, I say this for those who are here, but also other corporations, nobody's saying don't do. But understand that if you actually want to create these solutions, you have to make the investment. And while it is tragic with the happening with the grant programs, I think what we have to be mindful of is we don't need grants. I don't nope. want your damn free money. Because what it did post-COVID is it set up the belief that black businesses are not on par with white businesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The money was valuable because my friends and family didn't have that kind of money to give me. But we have to be mindful of the tools we use and the messages it sends. I don't want a bunch of grant programs. This is me from the government because that would signal that I need to be subsidized, mm -hmm. which then says I can be commoditized. And I'm trying not to be commoditized anymore. And so I think it's important that people go back and look at the track records that have existed amongst black GPs and black business and say, hey, there has been successes. There have been exits. There is precedent. And we have to get our institutions, banks, databases, to not be afraid to track by race. Mm -hmm. PitchBook to this day, which is the largest database that tracks venture investing, will not track by race. Mm -hmm. It will track by women, and that was after lots of fights. Mm -hmm. And so I do also think from a policy, big P or small P, we have to create an environment where we are comfortable saying, we effed up, let's try to fix it, because it is pretty hard, I'll put my academic head on, to develop solutions with a lack of data. And I think in many cases it has been glazed over and we don't have the data that talks about how big the disparity is. So with no disrespect to Janice, you can say you're giving me 100 billion, but the disparity is 500 billion. Who gives a hoot? Like you're not really solving my problem and you're still continuing to widen that gap. So just picking up that strand for Leah. Leah, you're in the leadership development space. Mm -hmm. You speak to a lot of corporations about what they should or shouldn't be doing, how they can, actually create more innovative solutions that will benefit the bottom line. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing, what the innovative solutions are that are being implemented that could potentially help close the wealth gap? Absolutely, but before I go there, I just cannot let one thing go. So Janice, you were talking about um, opportunities and we were talking about grant pro programs, et cetera, et cetera. We work quite a bit with Fortune 500 companies. And what's interesting is when you are a small business, just how you are paid. And with some companies, they will actually give you an incentive to be paid faster, so maybe it's net 60 days, net 75. Well, if you pay one point, you can be paid in 21 days. So what happens with a small business who wants to manage cash flow, it becomes like a check cashing, <laughs> a check cashing uh, environment where you're yep. like, okay, I wanna be able to manage cash flow or wanna be able to invest in my business, I'll go ahead and pay this point. What's unfortunate about that is we get caught in a trap because we get very dependent on that cycle. So something else, so one solution for companies is to, be, is to burn that off. Um, my husband's in commercial real estate, and if you've ever done commercial real estate, you know that you have to have a personal guarantee when you go into mm -hmm. a space. Over time, sometimes you can get that personal guarantee to burn off so you're not you know, held responsible for the length of a, of a lease. Well, in business, we need to be able to do the same thing. When we show up as good vendors and good suppliers, we need to be able to burn off that 1% so that we can benefit from being able to do business with large corporations. Because that's part of what will help us to, be, to, to, to shorten the wealth gap is because we can pay our, we can pay our suppliers more, we can pay our team more, and we can educate them to help shorten the wealth gap. 
And I'll say with our, our less than the wealth gap, I'll say with many companies, I would say that there are um, exemplars, but we don't have this figured out, obviously. And part of what I believe that needs to happen is we need to have an operating definition of what does equity mean across the board? What does that look like? Because we can talk about the programs and some of the solutions, but if they are not sustainable, it, what, what are we having the conversation for? So we need to have the innovation, we need to have the impact, and we need to be able to measure it, because that's what matters. When we have these conversations about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and people say, well, it's gonna take a really long time. Well, why? Why? Why is it going to take a long time to do the right thing? Mm. Makes no sense to me. If this were a serious business imperative and I had a go-to-market strategy that I had to get done in six months, if I didn't do it, what would happen? Mm -hmm. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you out, you get out. the boot, right. get the boot. You out. So why don't we put more, more time and why don't we put more of a, of a stake? Why don't we say, if this doesn't get fixed in six months, then this will happen. We need to be able to put that responsibility onto our business leaders onto our team members to say, we're, we're not having it any other way. We have to do it now. And Dr. Martin Luther King has been brought into the space a couple of times today, and I just wanna bring up, this: the fear, there is a fierce urgency of now. Tomorrow is in fact too late, and we don't have time to vacillate on if it's the right thing, should we, shouldn't we, we have to. We yep. have to have the impact and we have to do something differently tomorrow. Yep. Can I, can I just, I just want to add yes, to that sir. because I think what happens when we talk about this stuff, people think it has to be this monumental thing. Right. right we all know how slow academia moves. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm happy to say that when Georgetown, after it realized it was built by slaves, decided to repent, it, one of the things, <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it, we were the first to at least say so, but one of the things we realized is doing business with black businesses was causing a challenge because we were net 60. Mm -hmm. So we went to the president, went to the CFO, and now they get paid 24 hours. Wow. If they can do it, anybody can do it. Wow. But I think what's important is when people <laughs> say, well, you know, it's too expensive, what we have to realize once again is that these big businesses are subsidized by small businesses. Mm -hmm. That that one point, right, that they call their carrying costs, it just gives them cash flow to do other things. Mm -hmm. So I think we do at some point in time, at a real structural level, look at what are the business and financial models that have been created mm -hmm. so you get to hold my money so you can go make some more. That's exactly what big companies are doing. And so I think that for the corporate folks, it is thinking about what can we do while still being profitable, because it's a fiduciary role, but not doing it to the disadvantage of small businesses. How do you get a purchase order from a Target or a Walmart, but you don't get paid for net 90? They don't need that money. No. You do. <laughs> I mean, that's the last group of people. And so I do think, again, from a business perspective, if you don't want to make big policies, you don't want to be out in front, just have your CFO run the daggone numbers and say, where can I be making an impact mm -hmm. and just how I'm doing business with my terms and conditions. Yes. And I, I I, I will say, I think that is the solution to the issues that we're having today. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to go front and center on a lot of things, but you can fix some of the things that you're already doing mm -hmm. to make it better for your suppliers and just to push for them because supplier diversity is one of the biggest things I'm concerned about. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that finding those solutions are going to be key yeah. because everybody found the black bank to invest in, all of the sort of yes. low hanging fruit. <laughs> but what else can we do? I think is really important. Yeah. So last question, because we're running out of time. I could spend all day talking to you all about this. Looking into your crystal balls from the lens of the law, leadership development, business and investments, government, what are the biggest opportunities that we haven't fully realized? What are the threats we don't yet see? I'm gonna and I'll let start with whoever Janice. wants to start. <laughs> start with something. Well, I'll, I'll jump in here. I think one of the biggest threats is this threat of acting like we don't know what we learned four years ago. Mm. We can't unlearn what we learned. It, it, it makes, it's, it's nonsensical. So we have to wake back up and say, I get it, I realize it, I notice it, I need to do something about it. Because it didn't change, right? We know that bias exists, we all have biases in this room, we know that we need to address them, but we can't allow people to go back to sleep. Um, people who are opposed to diversity, equity, inclusion, who are definitely opposed to equity, want to make it seem like um, that there is a, 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 a bad, big bad you know, animal, there's a big fear around, if I get something, then you're not gonna have anything. 
Well, when I look at this pie, mm -hmm. right, and it's very interesting that we have this model of a pie, mm -hmm. this pie to me, there's infinite pies behind it. Mm -hmm. But if we don't believe that and we don't move that way, people are gonna say, well, no, I don't wanna, I don't wanna share. I want my pie and you go and get your pie. But what we have to realize is there's an infinite amount of opportunity and an infinite amount of pies for all of us. And we cannot unlearn what we learned and we have to do something differently. And to your point, it's something small. It is all of our responsibility in here to do something. My encouragement to everyone, and I'm a big action-oriented person, you cannot go back to your offices and your homes tomorrow and not do anything. Mm -hmm. If it's a phone call, if it's a coffee, if it's a, a post, whatever it is, you have to do something. Mm -hmm. I yeah. will just say I'm optimistic um, that people like Janice are in the administration, yeah. um, that people like uh, Isabella mm. are in the administration when the 8A program was, was attacked and ensued. So I'm optimistic that there are people who are willing to stand up for the fight, um, and it's not just black people. So I'm optimistic that the army is, is getting bigger. Uh, I'm optimistic when I think of people like B. Dixon, who just had this huge opportunity of over $300 million to just buy part of the company. I'm optimistic that Squire is a black billion dollar company. Mm -hmm. I'm optimistic that the numbers are starting to come and as my own, and we still continue to rise. Mm -hmm. My hope is that these dots do not become just continued anecdotes that we can all spew on stages, mm -hmm. but that they hit a critical mass that regardless of how you feel about me based on my color, you understand that partnering with me actually will drive economic prosperity in this country, not leaving me out. Yep. Yes. Yep. Um, okay. Do you want yep. Me? Yep. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll go. I don't want to be the last one. Um, <laughs> so I'll say, the, if there is anything that this experience of representing these folks who've been sued over the last year have taught me is the power of coming together. Um, we are working with more nonprofits than we've ever have of thinking about it. My first call after this decision was to every single organization, many, you know, many people of color own them to say, I think this decision is going to impact your livelihood and your mission. So I think that there are more people reaching out to help others coming up and keep doing the important work. But moreover, I think there's been really great coalition building. Mm. Um, what I will say is I think that the threats are everywhere. Mm. I think that the threats are within your organization. I think that everyone needs to be really thoughtful. Um, the reverse discrimination cases that are coming, blaming DEI for one, the reason, there was a just a commissioner charge file by someone who didn't get a job who said, I did not get this job because there was a requirement of hiring 50% underrepresented people. That's it. Mm -hmm. That is insane. Like if I don't get a job, I don't think it's because someone else has it. So what I would say is I think that threats are real. I think that these lawsuits are not going away. I think that they are scare tactics. However, I think that there are people who are doing the work um, that are truly building a coalition to fight it. And I invite all of you to come with your ideas because we're going to need them and send them to Alfonso, who's <laughs> leading, <laughs> leading the charge on this really, really important issue. Um, so I think I'll end on- On uh, behalf of the federal government. On behalf of the entire federal government. <laughs> no. uh, that, um, I, I see out of the corner of my eye, uh, Deputy Secretary Graves over mm -hmm. here. So I'm gonna leave the on behalf of the entire federal government to the <laughs> deputy. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Day one principle for this administration is a theme that has been on our panel, it was in the previous conversation, is that we are not gonna be able to build the kind of economy that we want unless we're unlocking the, the marginalized, the, the people that have been overlooked, under-resourced. Um, we're just not gonna get there. Our demographics are such, uh, the, the, our global co uh, competition is such that we need, um, we need maximum productivity. We can't afford to leave people on the economic sidelines. Mm -hmm. And so while I, um, I 
worry a lot about the point that Melissa made. We have, we have consistently shown a willingness to go against our own self-interest. I hope one of the things that we don't unlearn from the last few years is that um, when, um, something you said, Zakai, when we center the most vulnerable, we actually produce outsized returns for everybody. for everybody. And an investment in black America, an investment in the under-resourced uh, under is an investment in our entire country. It grows the pie, it produces more pies. Mm -hmm. And now is the time to do it. We are in the middle of building the next middle class and that's the opportunity that I want. When you're thinking about the homework you've just been given, think about all of the invest, the public sector investments that are being made and the opportunity that it is creating to build wealth in our country. And by the way, the deputy secretary runs one of those biggest programs. So he, <laughs> I'm gonna leave it to him to, to talk about that. Um, but it's a huge opportunity in front of us. And I, um, despite all the headwinds, uh, maybe because it is absolutely necessary in my job, I have decided on uh, rebellious optimism on I the opportunity that. in front of us. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I, I want to thank a stellar group of women with very, very big brains, and they're using those brains to advance economic opportunity for all. What I often think about in this work is how important it is for all of us to look in the mirror mm. and see beyond ourselves. Mm. Because we are in a space right now where it is very easy for people to look beyond the policy issue that doesn't affect them yes. and say, it's not about me. Yes. But everything that we're talking about is about all of us. Yes. And to the extent we're not invested in economic opportunity for all, we're not invested in ourselves. Mm -hmm. So to the extent we can recalibrate the paradigm that we operate in, maybe there's just hope that all of the roadmaps that we've outlined in this conversation will actually come to fruition. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.